You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. A little bit of a press war, I would say, going on that most people might not notice, but I kind of noticed it this week. And it was The Athletic, who does not have a White Sox beat reporter, talking about the White Sox, basically Ken Rosenthal, and then an article that came out later on in the week. And in the middle of that article, there's there's first Ken Rosenthal saying that Pedro Grafol is a dead man walking. And then there's the obligatory Bob Nightingale says they're not getting rid of him this year. So you know that Jerry immediately was like, Bob, or whoever's close to Jerry, it's probably Tony, right? Tony calls up Bob and goes, we're not getting rid of him. Because that's the attitude of this team. How dare you have a problem with something that we're doing wrong? It, and, and Pedro's perfect for this owner because he's got the same attitude. How dare you question me batting a guy with the bases loaded when we're trying to get a win who's got a 0. 0.75 average? How dare you? How dare you do it? To the point where Ozzy's making fun of him on the postgame or pregame the next day or whatever. Like, Pedro, all you had to do is say, I didn't want to use up both my catchers, and uh, I thought that he was due. Like, come up with something stupid. Don't don't act indignant like we're all stupid fans for questioning you. Anybody should question that decision. And it's the same thing with the White Sox front office, Ed. Somebody said, this guy is going to get fired before the season's over, and they're going to bring in a new manager or change the culture before the young guys get up. And then Bob Nightingale's got the, they're not getting rid of him, and they're only going to look at moving him in the off-season story. And then the most beautiful thing about it, Ed, is what The Athletic put out next, which was the survey of 100 Major League Baseball players. Did you see that? Ah, yes. I I, I love the back and forth. I mean, I really do. I I love the back and forth here because you're right. It exposes the White Sox for what they are, which is a team that, I I mean, honestly, what, what what the hell's the harm in Ken Rosenthal saying that Pedro's a dead man walking? I think if you were to poll 100 Major League players, 100 Major League managers and former managers, 100 Major League Baseball attendees, 100 people who have never even seen a baseball, they would all say that Pedro Gafrol is just doing a lousy job and this team is the worst team in baseball and there needs to be massive changes. That could include the GM. That could include ownership. That could include every single player on the roster who maybe is not named Luis Robert Jr. or Garrett Crochet. Burn it all to the ground and move the organization to Ozinga Field and start over. Like that. <laughs> or something like that. I mean, it's it's not it's not even something you need to respond to necessarily the way that they did. But yet they did it. They did. They felt the need after Rosenthal says that he's hearing that at some point they're going to move on from Pedro. And that probably comes from Getz, a guy who will not get in front of a microphone right now because he doesn't want to lie to you. I believe Chris Getz doesn't like the fact that we say, if you do this, you are a liar. If you don't do this, you are a liar. You made these promises. He doesn't want to be that. And he cannot sit there and justify what his manager is doing anymore. And that's why he never steps in front of a camera. Because I think Chris Getz wants to fire this fool. The worst manager of my lifetime, and I'm 47 years old. Worse than Terry Boom Boom Bevington. Worse than the second iteration of Tony La Russa, Worse than Jerry Manuel falling asleep in the dugout in 2003. This is the worst manager of my lifetime. He can't justify any decision he ever makes. Every time he opens up his mouth, he somehow makes it worse. His reasoning is flawed at every level from in-game to how he's running the team to how he's dividing up playing time. And he's indignant and angry at people for asking him questions. And let me tell you something. We all know that the press corps that follows this team handles everybody over there with kid gloves. I'm not saying that they're bad at what they do, but you never have somebody press them enough that they get pissed off. So they get treated really well by the press corps that follows them around. And then there's st- he's still angry. When you ask a question like, why are you in multiple opportunities to break a game open, allowing Martin Maldonado to come up to the plate when you have plenty of pinch hitters and one of them is the be- one of the better hitters on your team and most consistent in driving in runs in Corey Lee, who's a better catcher? And you come up with, well, I like his defense. Every defensive metric says that Martin Maldonado sucks. And they're so dense. I mean, John Schriffen's on, on television and he's championing 
the idea that everybody's saying they want to vote Maldonado into the All-Star game. Like, he doesn't even get the joke. He doesn't get the fact that this is Southsiders, this is White Sox fans, mocking their team by writing in Martin Maldonado. And that's a real thing happening on social media right now. It's incredible. And he doesn't even get it. They are the densest team. And, it, and you know what? It turns out it's not just the fans in Chicago who think that they're dense and bad at what they do. It's Major League Baseball players. Oh, no kidding. The, the Athletic did a survey of 100 baseball players, and they asked them what organization has a bad reputation amongst players. Now, they actually listed that only 79 of the 100 players responded. So just under 80 players respond so to this thing. 21 of them sat there and went, I value getting money too much to answer this question. They didn't even want to answer the question. Right. 19 players, though, still come forward and say the Chicago White Sox, making them second only to the Oakland A's. The Oakland A's, who are unabashedly trying to ruin Major League Baseball in the city of Oakland and, and, and have a reputation for long being one of the worst organizations, worst run organizations in any major sport. And the White Sox, you're number two. Well, you know what? That's in keeping with Jerry, though. He never really wants to win at these things. He just <laughs> wants to stay competitive and aim for second place. He's second place in the race to be the worst organization in the opinion of these players. Right. And, and then here are the quotes. And I know that people have seen them already, but I, I want to read them because it's amazing. I love it. This is from Major League Baseball players pulled anonymously by The Athletic with their opinion on the White Sox. Quote, I never heard a good thing. The next quote, unlike some other bad teams, they have more potential to be good. I think that kind of indicates what we always talk about. They could be better, but they've got morons making decisions. Right. Quote, it sounds like no one wants to be there day in and day out. Like it's a grind just to show up to the ballpark. I couldn't imagine. Another quote from another Major League Baseball player. It's not good over there. You can tell by how often there's turnover that it usually means something's going on. Players leaving the organization and automatically doing better with their new team. And another quote, Kevin Pillar, poor communication. That's what oh, was said yeah. about the Chicago White Sox. And then you see the poor communication when Grafol is bellyaching, a guy who's got 50 losses, one of the quickest teams to 50 losses in the history of Major League Baseball over 120 some years. And he's bellyaching because he's not getting enough communication sent down to him from the front office, mainly because what? Chris gets is done with him and doesn't feel any need to talk to him. Yeah, I mean, you can well, see that, but that's probably what ended up happening. Yeah, you've been cut off. I mean, I look, I lost a job once and, and I had to deal with the sales team at this particular company. And when all the salespeople unanimously kind of stopped talking to me all at once, it took me a couple of days to realize that it had been awfully quiet. But then the writing was very much on the wall. So when my boss came to me that Friday, it was like, well, we're letting you go. I already knew. Like, it came as not a surprise. I had already kind of cleaned out my desk a little bit because I was like, well, something's wrong here. Things are changed. I don't, I'm not getting communication. I'm not hearing things. Yeah, Pedro, that's kind of the way it works. The precursor to you losing your job is Chris Getz isn't investing any more damn time in you. Here's Grafol on June 8th. Just because there are so many things that happen throughout the day up in that office, I've experienced that. I know what goes on up there and how fast things change. Sometimes the communication doesn't get down here as quick as you would want it. You're going to throw barbs? You're going to throw barbs when you're that bad? That's a guy who knows the owner won't fire him and that the boss wants to fire him. There's tension. It's, it's palpable. There's tension. You have a first-year GM who's learning that even though he was able to get the job, he really doesn't have the power and you've got a manager who's saying, eh, I know the old man's going to keep me around. He thinks, Grafol, I think, honestly believes it's because they're both good baseball men and they get along. He doesn't realize it's because Jerry's just as cheap and doesn't want to pay two managers. Clearly, he feels like he's not the problem. And, and he's, he's got a, a situation where maybe he thinks he's in on the gag, too, when he's saying that he likes Martin Maldonado's defense, and that's why he's not pinch hitting for him, because he knows that that was why Maldonado was signed. That's what Maldonado's reputation and his entire employment in the major leagues has been about for for his, his career. Is you know well, I really like his defense. However, he's not getting across the sarcasm if that's what he's doing. So if, if Pedro's really if he's one of us and he's sitting there going like, "Good God, why do I work here?" But you know he's not going to try and lose his job. And he's saddled with a team of guys that don't care, 
aren't making enough money, don't feel like they want to be there. It's a grind to show up to the ballpark. They're not getting communication from the front office. They don't feel wanted. Whatever the situation is there, the whole idea of the culture and all that stuff that, that was supposed to be instilled, if if Pedro, and I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt in this sentence, if Pedro is sitting there sarcastically saying, this is what's going on, that I really just love Martin Maldonado's defense because he's been asking Chris Getz to get him another catcher to go with Corey Lee who can actually play the game, well then, I don't think that's pa- the case. Pedro, you got to go watch old Friends episodes and learn how to talk like Matthew Perry used to. Could he be better at defense? There you go. No, now I, get I don't sarcasm. think that's what he's doing. Ed. I think he really likes Martin Maldonado. It's beautiful outside. You want to throw open a window. Alas, the window that you have is old, it's dingy, and doesn't even open the entire way. That's why you have to go to Window and Doors Superstore of Oak Forest. Exterior windows, doors, patio doors, storm doors. Now is the time. Get out to their big, beautiful showroom. See everything in person in full living color. Owner in showroom, owner on site. You always have somebody there that can answer all of your questions. All window and door superstore installers, they don't farm out the work. They've been doing it that way for over 40 years. In Oak Forest since 1985, with all major brands custom made and no stock items for a perfect fit. Get out to Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest, one half block east of 159th and Ridgeland at 6280 159th Street. See more at windowdooroakforest.com. Pedro has a lot of the same traits as Tony, which is why it seems like Pedro got hired and they all love each other up there in that office. He's got that thing where it's like, well, it's a, it's a veteran. So a veteran gets far more rope. It's, you know, I'm going to stick with what the guy did in his career, even though he hasn't hit over 200 in four full seasons, they fit their owner. I mean, really it's the, the line. You can find out exactly who's in what camp by just looking at their personalities. Reinstorf, Tony, the two of them are always on the same wavelength. It's probably not Ryan Storff talking to Bob Nightingale. It's probably Tony La Russa. But you could see that that comes out because they didn't like the article. And then you've got Pedro. And we what we've got with these three guys is we've got three guys who we've seen demonstrated over years and years, especially with the owner and with the manager, have always shown in their personality. Even when Tony La Russa was a young, fiery manager his first time through or when he was with the Oakland A's in the early 90s, Tony didn't like being questioned. And if you question Tony... Tony was just going to go out there and prove that you were wrong. Okay. You see him in interviews on MLB network and he, if he gets asked something or challenged something, he gets angry, he turns into angry old man. Right. And, and that's what this is all about. That's why you get the Nightingale response. That's why they dig in deeper. They don't like the peons. They don't like those that haven't played the game. They don't like those that don't have their credentials telling them they're wrong. And so you can point out something super obvious to them. You could be like, this is wrong. Here are all these stats. Here's all this proof. Here's a mountain of evidence. And here are all these other experts that agree with us. And they will dig in and release something through Nightingale saying, we're keeping him the whole year now. They'll dig in like what Pedro's doing saying, I love Maldonado. And this is the hot topic. How many times did he say that when he was giving that response? This is the hot topic. And I know you're going to ask me, but I'm not changing my answer. They're like stubborn children who like cross their arms and they're angry because they've been exposed and they're just too stubborn to admit that they've been exposed. And the only way to clear people like that out is to fire them. But when the owner is exactly the same way, a guy who has a PR department, I've said this before, this is a baseball club. This is a public relations community baseball club in which baseball is played, but in reality is a machine to build a monument and a reputation for a billionaire who knows he's going to die one day and wants to be remembered fondly. So they do everything they can to poo-poo anybody that says that he's bad at what he does. You say he's a terrible baseball owner, they'll bring up Michael Jordan, who played a completely different sport. But that's what they'll do. Everybody on that 05 team had the greatest year in their entire career. If you look at their baseball cards, somehow, somehow, All 26 of them seem to have the greatest season of their entire career, the greatest run that they ever had. Go look one day. It's fun to look at. And that's why they won the 05 World Series. It wasn't because he spent a ton of money. It wasn't because Ken Williams was a genius. He tried to acquire Ken Griffey Jr. middle of the season, and Griffey Jr. refused him. And it would have broken up that threesome of Creedy and Rowan and and Pierzynski that was the heart of the team that pushed them all the way through. 
And he broke it up anyway in the following offseason because he was so convinced that Brian Anderson was a major league center fielder. And he was wrong. Tadahito Gucci wasn't his starting second baseman. Willie Harris was. And then Tadahito just kind of fell to him. Dustin Hermanson had a bad back and Shingo Takatsu was a flash in the pan. And that's who were your closers, not Bobby Jenks. He came out of nowhere. There was so much luck and fortune. And if I take out the luck and fortune of that year, this team has done nothing in the 40 plus years that Jerry Reinsdorf has been the owner. He is one of the worst owners of his era and generation over the last 50 years of modern baseball. He's one of the he's one of the worst baseball owners that's out there. And they will try to tell you up and down that they're not wrong. He loves the team. He cares about the team. He wants to win so much. He's a good baseball man. And that's the problem. You have a stubborn old billionaire who doesn't like the fact that everybody's telling him that he's wrong. So he's pissy and he goes and has meetings in Nashville and he's like, I might move my team. And, he, you know, he's he's just a petulant, angry old man behind a big giant desk surrounded by money. But he he knows that the majority of people think that he's bad at what he does. And rather than change, rather than sit there and say, you know what, I'm going to try it a different way. I'm going to bring in somebody who's who's going to run my organization from the outside because I want to win. He stubbornly crosses his arms and he hires internally. And he keeps around. He's got Tony in the building, who's a smart baseball man. No doubt about it. But same personality. And he's got Pedro. Same personality. Not a smart baseball man. That's the difference between him and La Russa. And And that's what this team is. Unfortunately, you look at the last week. You feel like it's never going to get better because until Chris Getz can can convince this old man, and maybe the only way Getz will ever be able to convince him is if we all shut up. Somehow we all have to collectively start saying that we think Pedro's a good manager so that Jerry will fire him because he's, it's almost as if now he's holding on to him because public opinion against Reinsdorf has Reinsdorf so angry that he's keeping this guy in place. It's hard to say. You know, it really is. How is it hard to say? It seems really obvious, right? I mean, take a step back. Seriously, this old man is angry that we're saying he's bad at what he does. Everything that comes out of this team is a side-handed response to this team. And it's been going on for years. Back when Kenny Williams would tell people stay out of White Sox business and and they would and they would just they they would they would tear in anybody that ever criticized them. Like, how dare you? And it's always a puff piece on their own network about how much he loves the team, where he gets to pick the questions, obviously. You could tell. Like this is I don't think it's hard to say. I think it's really easy to say if you've been around the team. Like, if I had only been around this team for a couple of years, okay, fine, I don't know very much. I've been watching this team now for well over four decades. I've been around and been aware and been old enough to remember every moment of Jerry Reinsdorf's time with this team. So I know what he is. I've seen it. Oh, no, I I agree with you on, you know, him being a petulant old man and him having to be right and him having to you know, constantly be praised for being a good baseball man and being a, a, a good, you know, a good owner, a great owner, a legendary owner, as it were. But it's it's hard to say if that comes from, you know, him just being a petulant old billionaire or if this is really just after 40 years, okay, you have no ability for him to see what this game is, okay? I don't know if it's out of out of ego and petulance or out of willful stupidity and ignorance. And that's where, that's what's, what's hard to say for me because I see it the other way too. Okay. I'm not saying that Jerry Reinsdorf's an unintelligent man or a bad businessman because clearly he made a lot more money than I've ever made and will ever make in my life. All right. So I can't question him on that, but does he understand, has he understood what the game is and where the game is going? Cause he, he still acts like, the Jerry Reinsdorf that took over the White Sox in the 1980s. You know, he made one splashy signing in Carlton Fisk. They had one really lucky good season in 1983. I mean, let's face it, that team was not exactly a dynasty building team. And, you know, from there on out, it seems like he's always struggled to understand what the game is. He knows what he wants the game to be. But, you know, going back to the strike and not really understanding what the game is, going back to... You know, the, the the idea that that you don't hand out $100 million contracts, the idea that you don't give pitchers more than three years. The idea that he didn't want Mark Burley around, which Mark Burley said on the broadcast the other day I when know, he was right? there. And, 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 he, and Mark Burley was going to take less money. I always blamed Williams for that. 
I got to tell oh, you, 100%. I always blame as Williams as, for that. He was, keeping Mike, Williams. he was keeping Mike Soraka because Mike Soraka was younger and he had more potential and he was moving on from Mark Burley because Mark Burley was older and he didn't think he was going to be any good anymore. And I thought it was a misevaluation of talent because Burley goes on to be a pretty good damn pitcher for several more years. But now you realize it's because Reinsdorf, Reinsdorf didn't want to bring him back. I love the fact that Burley said it on the broadcast. That had to just make so many teeth grind in that front office when he said it. Especially Mark Burley of all people. He won't be back. They'll forget to give him tickets in the future. That's how they operate. Well, yeah, and, and it's not like we'll forget that Mark Burley was, you know, probably the most beloved player in, in modern White Sox history. I, I you know, I don't I don't think I'm I don't think I'm slighting Frank Thomas on that. I don't think I'm slighting anybody else on that. I mean, Mark Burley was a reason to go to the ballpark. Mark Burley threw a perfect game and a no hitter that could have been a perfect game, except for a you know a ball that was just slightly inside to Sammy Sosa that he promptly picked Sosa off, like you know almost right away. Mark Burley came out in the World Series in relief in the third game when it was like what just it was just the longest game ever I think in history yeah. at the time, and he was drunk. And he got the save. He been drinking, <laughs> and he got the save. Okay, <laughs> Mark Burley is a damn legend for this team. But again, you know, it, it is. That's what I mean. Like it's the short sightedness, and I think it's the baseball stupidity to a certain degree. I, I don't think that Jerry Reinsdorf is a good baseball person for what Major League Baseball really is. I think he's a good baseball person for Charlie Comiskey's era. There you go. Like. He he is he is a throwback. He is an anachronism in a game that does not need them and does not have place for them. And that's why when you poll a hundred players, seventy nine of them who bother to answer the poll, you know, you have the the second most responses are it just doesn't look like anybody likes being there. Because as a player, I'm sorry, I'm sitting here, I'm thinking ahead. You know, Luis Robert Jr. might welcome a trade from this team because when his contract ends, does he feel like he's going to get the value? that he deserves, and it's assuming that he stays on the field and proves himself, but does he feel like he's going to get the value he he will earn on the open market from Jerry Reinsdorf, or is he going to have to take less money to be here? I think we all, I don't even have to answer that question. I know the answer to that question. Yeah, and, and the other thing is just the culture. I mean, the, the amount of times that I get told by people anecdotally, get messages from people, talk to people around the ballpark, talk to people around the team. Anecdotally, it sounds like the visitor side is always far more lively. The batting cages are used far more teams show up and they're ready to go. And the White Sox are kind of like a lackadaisical team. I, I, I honestly had a conversation with somebody that has intimate knowledge of the, of the field and, and what it's like with players that are on the field who recently told me that that's the impression of players when they come in and they're visitors like that, that, that team over there is kind of going at half speed and they don't, they don't do the same things that most major league baseball teams do. And that's all bled down from the top. I mentioned conversations that I've been having. I, I had a great conversation or 20 hanging out at Cork and Carry at the park, our official sponsor, back on Saturday during the homestand. I found one of my favorite food items, like on the entire South Side, randomly going through their menu. Check out the buffalo chicken egg rolls. They're a great value and they're really good. Like, I like buffalo chicken. I like buffalo chicken pizza. I like just having buffalo wings. Sometimes when somebody does something experimental, it's too hot or you're like, why would they make this? I was pleasantly surprised. It's my official recommendation right now when you're looking through the menu over at Cork and Carry at the park. And we were hatching something. There's something being hatched right now for Cub Sox over at the Cork. It's going to involve more than one podcast. We're going to bring in guests. Some of the other podcasts that you hear out there, I'm not making the official announcement until I'm sure everything is locked down, but great food, great drinks, amazing staff. I am struck by how well the folks working over there at Cork and Carry at the Park can keep up with the crowd that comes through there pre-game, post-game, in-game, and there's plenty of seats and plenty for everybody. Make it your plan the next time you head down to the ballpark, 33rd in Princeton, See more at CorkandCarry.com. Meanwhile, Drew Thorpe is coming. Let's see how long it takes for us to ruin this guy because he's spectacular. And this episode is being recorded before his debut. So I don't know how it's going to end up. As a White Sox fan, I assume he gave up nine runs in the first inning. And uh, he's being sent right back down again because that's just the way that things normally go. But James Fox predicted on this show, and he was the first video guest that we ever had on our YouTube channel. And there's going to be more to come. Uh, we have Steve Paradzinski 
joining us on uh, next Monday. And I've got several other guests that are lined up as we ramp up the extra videos that are going to end up on YouTube. But James and I sat down and talked and you can see that extended interview on YouTube or check out the last episode for the, the some of the good parts of it. Uh, and he talked about the idea a lot of these guys in double A are going to make the jump and skip triple A. And then right away, you get Drew Thorpe coming up, a guy who I'm not going to worry about what his first game was. Now, watch, he probably had a great first game, but I'm just assuming as a Sox fan, he had a bad one. But what I'm looking at is a guy that in double A Birmingham, he had a 0.867 whip over 11 starts. He's giving up 0.5 home runs through nine and He had an ERA of 1.35, and he did the same thing when he was in double-A Somerset for the Yankees, pretty much, the year before. Everywhere he's gone. Wow. I mean, here's a guy who doesn't put a lot of guys on base and gets a lot of outs. So I don't care what his first first, uh, uh, appearance was. I'm very, very hopeful for this guy, and he needs to be a top-end rotation guy, Ed. Well, he needs to be, and I don't know, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and predict and say that he's going to be, but I think he's going to be a very effective major league pitcher given the right opportunity. And, oh, by the way, the game's got to be called a certain way for him because Drew Thorpe is not, he's not a stuff guy. He's not a guy that, that just sits there and chucks it up there and it just mystifies everybody who comes. He's got a really good, really, really good changeup that will get him out of trouble but he's got to spot everything else. You know, he's got to have control. He's got to have pitches called inside, outside. So if Martin Maldonado doesn't handle him well, if Corey Lee doesn't handle him well, unfortunately, if Ethan Katz ruins him because they're not calling the game correctly, that could happen to Drew Thorpe very, very easily because he's not going to be a guy that can overcome it. Now, the question is, is does Drew Thorpe have the baseball intelligence just to put it where he wants it in spite of the fact of what his catcher tells him? I think eventually he'll probably figure that out, but... You know, th- that's where I'm not really overly concerned either. But I am I am guarded against any optimism for young players coming up in this environment for the exact reason that you pointed out. There are you know no cultural guideposts that sit there and tell you that this is a team of guys who are really, really trying hard, that these are scrappy underdogs that are really, really doing everything they can and going all out. And I think the eyeball test, when you watch this team, you can kind of feel like the guys that are really pushing are the guys that have something that they really need to push for. The reason they're pushing because they're trying to get off the team. The guys that are pushing on this team are professionals, right? Like, why is Paul DeYoung and Tommy Pham, why are they having such success and other guys are not? They're professional baseball players who learned how to be professional baseball players in other organizations that were better run showed up here and said, look at this joke of a team and how it's run. I want out of here, so I am going to make sure I put the work in personally and get out of here. That's what you can see. You can see with your own two eyes. You can see the difference between somebody who grew up in a different organization and how they carry themselves and those that were raised by the White Sox. Well, not only that, but I mean, Paul DeYoung is playing for his major league career. Because he's got to show that he can still be a starting shortstop and that he's got some offensive viability. That's what that's what cost him his position with the Cardinals is that at the plate he stopped being offensively viable. Now, if he's going to continue hitting home runs and 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 having the success he's having, he's still striking out way too much for anybody's comfort level, I think. But he's kind of showing that, hey, if there's somebody out there that needs a shortstop that has half a prayer of doing something this year – that Paul DeYoung is a guy that, in the event of an injury or in the event of, of underperformance, continual underperformance by other shortstops around the league, that he could step in and he could take over a position for somebody that, that needs it. It's the same thing for Tommy Pham, who is here basically because he can be the best player on a lousy team, but he can also just go about his business, the business of Tommy Pham, and he can continue to do what he needs to do to show that, again, some team that needs him can come and get him, Right. The other guys that are, are, are showing up are guys that are, are the guys like Corey Lee that are trying to prove that they belong in the major leagues. It's all the rest of this team that that you sit there and it kind of makes you wonder. I mean, I'm sure Andrew Benintendi has some pride in his game. I'm also not seeing Andrew Benintendi or hearing anything about Andrew Benintendi, you know, that he's gone balls out to try and fix the problem. Well, the interesting thing with Andrew Benintendi is going to be, are you going to move Corey Jokes out of the way for Andrew Benintendi at this point when he comes back? Right, and Corey Jolks is another guy. Why is Corey Jolks doing so well? Why, Why is he in 282 with an 847 OPS just like he did for three years in the minor leagues? 
He got his first taste of the majors and he struggled like most young guys, but this is not a made up number. I know it's a small sample size, but this is what Corey Jokes is supposed to be. He just didn't do it the first time he was called up with the Astros. So now I would let this guy play. I'd let this guy play now and they're not going to do it. They're going to put Benintendi out there and he's going to play twice a week. Well, and that's that's part of the problem, too, is you get a guy like Corey Jokes. It's a great move by Chris Getz because this is a guy that that just needed an opportunity to show. You know, do, do you have something, Corey Jokes, okay? And and he's showing that, you know, again, small sample size, but he's showing that he can play this game at the major league level. And as an old rookie, he's got a lot invested in showing the White Sox and showing other teams that he is for real and he is a viable major league player. But again, what what happens when Andrew Benintendi comes back? What, what happens is Andrew Vaughn, we've talked about Andrew Vaughn, is Andrew Vaughn mentally broken too or is he physically broken? Well, What's no, going no, on they're there? Gonna, they're going to point to the fact that Andrew Vaughn, Andrew Vaughn's hitting 361 over his last 14 days. And so like they're going to sit there and say, all right, in his last nine games over 14 days, suddenly he's everything we thought he was going to be. He's hit two home runs. He's got 1,000 OPS. He just got off to a slow start. We were right. You were wrong. Trust me. He is not going to hit this clip the rest of the year. And I guarantee he settles in between 200 and 225 for the year. And they point to the one or two good months over the six bad months that he'll end up having when we look at the entire season. And the problem is that Vaughn doing well, and I'm happy for him good. I want a, I want a better I want Andrew Vaughn. Well. I don't want him to do badly, right? I'm just a realist who understands what he is because he's demonstrated over 1,500 at-bats before this season even started that he's replacement level when you look at him over 162 games. Now him hitting is going to convince them Ben intended the same thing will happen. We're paying him $75 million. Sit that guy, guy back down on the bench. And if Corey Jokes is basically has playing time taken away, and then in a couple of weeks when they finally move Fam, and they o- open up a spot in the outfield and he moves back in there, if he, he may not give you the same results because you interrupted him, and that's what I worry about with this team. Yeah, and and again, it's it gets back to the culture, and if Pedro, and it gets back to Pedro, if Pedro Grafal had these guys fighting hard, okay, and there was just a lack of talent. But if you looked at this team and you saw them and you saw them, you saw spirit, you saw, you know, a a certain amount of vigor, right? You saw some fight in them. You saw whatever it is that, that, that it is. Okay. That thing that we all see when teams are, you sit there and go, God, these guys are scrappy underdogs, right? If you saw that in the White Sox on a consistent basis, you know, I think you could sit there and say, okay, this is, this is a Chris Getz problem. He's got to find some talent for this team. And maybe a better manager, maybe somebody who who can, you know, push the buttons and get more out of the guys than what he's gotten. But you don't even see the culture, right? What you're hoping is, is you're hoping that Corey Lee is paying attention to Tommy Pham. You're hoping that Andrew Vaughn is is learning something from a Tommy Pham or learning something Paul DeYoung can give him that he can take forward and maybe take a step so that he's slightly above replacement or wherever his ceiling actually is at this point. Because like you said, so far, the floor and the ceiling have collapsed on each other and he's replacement level. And and that's all you can do at this point. And, you know, when I hear people up in arms about Chris Getz is asking for a King's Ransom for Luis Robert Jr., when I hear them up in arms about then, you know, should you even trade Robert? Should you trade Crochet? What is this team going to be in the future? Is this a full rebuild? I don't think it matters until, and this is going to have to start from the absolute top all the way down. I don't think it matters until the White Sox, as a franchise, find an identity that is consistent with modern Major League Baseball, that is friendly to players around the league, and and, and makes this place a place you want to go to, and is something that the fans can get behind and say, yes, that's what it means to be on the South Side. Sox in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.